This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode, where my guest is artist and activist Katie Holton. Katie has just released a book called The Language of Trees, a collection of literary and scientific works by people like Robin Wall Kimmerer, Ursula Le Guin, and Ross Gay. Using her alphabet of trees, the book is underpinned by Katie's art and asks us to examine our relationship with trees by pulling together wide-reaching strands and demonstrating in one place just how connected we are to them. Katie begins by telling us about her background. That's easy because I'm right here. I'm in my mum's garden right now in RD and it's the east coast of Ireland. So I grew up in rural Ireland. And my mum is a gardener and a floral artist. So it means all my memories of when I was little were from being outside, hands in the dirt, mud puddles, collecting twigs and stones and outside all the time, running around wild in the fields because it's rural Ireland. So that means everywhere is, is fielded. And I don't know if we'll get into that later, but this notion that Ireland is this wonderful green emerald isle I think we're slowly, quickly realising that means that it's all agriculture. So the green of it is uh, fertilisers and chemicals and sprays and everything is cut up into little fields. But when I was little, to me, it was just running wild and free. And I have the best memories of spending time in the hedges and under the trees at the edges of the field. So those edge spaces are always, I think when you get older, you realise how important they are. And of course, when you're little, you're just running around trying to find your own secret space. But those are the the memories. I always come back to the, to these trees and and lying under them. And now I've already forgotten what your question was. <laughs> I've just gotten lost in memory lane. I love it. It's perfect. <laughs> absolutely perfect. And it does remind me a little bit of how the book's put together. And I, so I want you to tell me about the book. And I don't even know how to describe your influence on it, really. It's kind of editing, curating. You seem to have this kind of influence over the book, but it's not a traditional influence. So maybe you could just talk a little bit about the book, the idea behind it, and why you felt inspired to put it together. Yeah, well, The Language of Trees is really a love letter in a way, but because I'm a visual artist, sometimes I use the the idea that maybe I'm like a magpie that collects things but some people don't really like magpies so maybe that brings a negative connotation and for me it's all about love and a wild love for the world and try to bring together different voices and I've always with my work you know as an artist and being an artist I get to work in lots of different mediums so I've made lots of books before in the past but usually not with publishing houses like this one but I get to work in lots of different fields or areas of expertise. I can knock on doors and say, hey, I'm an artist and I'm interested in whatever the topic is, science, something that I don't know anything about. And people have always been, I've been doing this for decades now, and very greedy, trying to gobble up as much information as I can. And people have always been really open and excited. I think in general, if you find somebody who's interested in the work that you're doing and you love your work, you want to share it. So my work has always been a way of gathering and trying to learn about the world and how it works, how I'm connected to it and how, you know, as an individual, but obviously I'm connected to my family and my community. And then that community is part of a larger community. And then we're in a country that's part of a continent. And then we're all on a planet. And so we are all one family on this beautiful planet Earth. And these connections, they kind of ripple out. So you have the way you have patterns in nature repeat, the way trees, for example, the tree pattern with the branching, the branching is inside of our own bodies. You see it from outer space when you look down at earth and the rivers branching. So these patterns are there, they underlie and they repeat at different scales, microscopic, macroscopic, and this telescoping in and out inside of the body to outside of the whole universe is something that I've always, always been really just so excited to see that this must mean something. It's a very simple way of seeing how we're all connected. And can we maybe bring these strands and these branches together? Or if we look at one thing, maybe that's that, that this one thing that might be on a branch way over, over here, far away from this other thing. But it's a way to maybe see the similarities and the self-similarities and 
Um, I, I did study complex systems science at the Santa Fe Institute. It was way before COVID, but it was in a massive open online course. So it was before we did the, the Zooming and the COVID online learning. And MOOCs, that's what they call these online courses, were a big deal. Some people said this is going to be the future of learning, all being online, because you can join from anywhere on the planet if you have Wi-Fi and you don't need a lot of money to attend a university. And you can learn and have access to minds. And so I was very excited to speak with the community about complex systems. And I'm a very simple person. I always start with very simple questions like, what is a tree? And why do they branch? And why do they grow so big? And then know how to stop growing? And, you know, I've gotten in trouble for asking too many questions. But I think, you know, as humans, like when you're a child, that's what you do. You ask a lot of questions and they might be silly questions, but... Um, everyone who's had a, a child spend time with the child knows that sometimes those questions can kind of get to the heart of things and leave you speechless. Like, whoa, that really is something that when you get older, you somehow we shut down our minds and we forget to to be so in love with the world and to see these questions that maybe we've kind of been taught at school to stop thinking like that. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. And you know, talking about the magpie and the way that you start at the basics and then move out. Do you think that's how you started to collect the writings that are included in the book? Did you follow a thread and just keep going? Yeah, everything starts with drawings. So I I'm, do a lot of research, writing, reading, and I'm always making notes and those notes turn into drawings and it's a way of drawing, like literally drawing things together. So the language of trees grew out of an earlier book called About Trees. And that book was, that's when I made the tree alphabet. I knew immediately I wanted to turn the tree drawings into the characters for these love letters. And that's when I made the ABC. And so that book about trees, that was back in 2015, happened very quickly. And at first I thought the book was just going to have three essays. I was thinking about Rebecca Solnit, Tassa de Dean, and maybe myself to explain the tree alphabet. So it was going to be a very small, maybe like a pamphlet, and then it just grew out from there. Once I st literally sat down with a piece of paper and a pencil and started drawing out the tree alphabet and then the branches, you know, that Darwin's drawing, I included in that book about trees, Darwin's drawing, I think, which has his little twig stick drawing of the lines and he wrote, I think, and it was a way to map this evolutionary, how he thinks, thought that we have evolved. And... For me, that's kind of very simply how the book came into being, was one idea, making the tree alphabet, this ABC, translating texts into trees, and then what are the stories we can tell? And so it sort of snowballed very quickly. I realized, oh, I can kind of tell the history of everything. And because I was about to turn 40 in September of 2015, I had this secret idea that that book was going to be like a time capsule to celebrate what it is. What are the stories of being a 40-year-old human being on this planet? And because time is, is something that I've used a lot in my work and I feel is really important, this, this notion of human time. And um, we think in such short bursts of time, like down to the minute, like we were going to meet at 11. So we're here at 11. But in the time of plants and trees, that kind of means nothing because they're around for hundreds, thousands of years. Anyway, so the book it grew, and then once I realized I wanted to tell the story of what it is to be a human on planet Earth, it felt infinite. So it felt like that book was just the first series of an infinite set of books about trees. And there's so much I could include. That was the hard part, was having to pare it down and to say no and to say, oh, I can't include everything. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine because it is so all encompassing and it does connect to every other part really of life and the planet. So, yeah, I, I don't envy that job at all. And I'm sure you could do many more volumes. So you, I think, went into it then by the sounds of it with a kind of an idea of your own. Did any other themes emerge as you were bringing stuff together that you didn't immediately think of? When when I got the invitation to make the language of trees, it all happened very quickly. It was unusual in publishing you, uh, sometimes publishing takes has a long time frame you know the writer will spend years on their manuscript then they'll get the editor and there, there'll be a lot of time to do that and then the you might finish your book and then it doesn't come out for another year whereas this 
book is happening at warp speed, <laughs> lightning fast. The whole thing happened, you know, in a few months. I got the invitation from the editor at Tin House, the um, US publisher, and they really wanted the book to come out in the spring. It was published in America on April 4th. So the timing, that was one aspect because I was so excited to have the opportunity to to remake this book about trees. So obviously I was greedy to try and include more and more and more. This isn't really answering your question, but it's just the realities of making a book or you do any, any project, right? You have the parameters. Obviously financial is one, <laughs> a huge one, but then the time constraints. So I'm just trying to think what did I learn through doing it? I guess one thing when I made the first book, it was very much an artist book. I was an artist reaching out to friends and colleagues and people I had worked with. That's why I was able to make it so quickly, because it was just one on one conversations and people would say, sure, that sounds great. I'd be happy to either write a new piece or, or give you work to include in the book. That made it all very easy. Then coming to publishing, I don't know how this podcast isn't necessarily about publishing or how much you want to know about the nitty gritty. But the realities of publishing with a tin house meant that we needed to get all of those permissions in paperwork and signed through all of the relevant permissions departments from the various people. So that became the whole project in a way. So if I became a secretary and spent a year, well, it was many, 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 many months having to contact, say, okay, well, I have the artist or the writer's permission to include their work. Now I need to have the stamp of approval and this document from the publishing house. And so that was a whole project in itself. I've laughed and said, I should make a book or something about the making of the book. So learning that side of things, which was something that I hadn't necessarily done before, it wasn't very pleasant. Everybody was super generous and, and lovely, everyone that I communicate, but it's just so tedious. <laughs> and, you know, I was suffering from long COVID, but I didn't realize it at the time. I just thought I was dying. It was the worst year of my life. It was so difficult. So maybe we don't want to dwell on that. Maybe we should move on to the next question because I don't like dwelling on negative things. No, but it is interesting because that process of putting all of that together has produced this amazing artwork in the form of a book. And I think it's easy to get lost in that. And that's what you want, I'm imagining. You know, you want people to get lost in the beauty of it. But it is interesting that you could have this romantic view of life as an artist and actually you've ended up doing a lot of admin <laughs> stuff. So it's it's interesting. It's good to highlight it, definitely. And you mentioned before the tree alphabet, and that is definitely your expression of the artistic side of things. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah, so the, the tree alphabet is something that's kind of had this long germination process. So I've made tree drawings. I moved to New York back in 2004, which was almost 20 years ago now. It's crazy. Um, and it was supposed to be just for one year. I was doing a Fulbright research, very interested in in nature. Like, what what is that term, nature, that little word? What does it even mean? Because I always thought, well, we are nature, we're humans, we're just another animal. And I felt like I needed to be in a city. So I was very lucky to get this Fulbright, which meant I had the opportunity to rent an apartment, be in New York. It was independent research, so I could just walk the streets and meet people. And that's where it all started, really, because I was in the East Village, Alphabet City, and I learned that the street trees, or I discovered that the street trees are really how people have any kind of their first and sometimes only contact with nature. This you know, the concept we're sort of brought up to think that nature is something separate from us and it's far away. You have to get in your car or get on the train and drive out to some national park to experience nature rather than realizing that it's everything. Everything that we make as humans is also part of nature. And so being in the city, you realize that these street trees are the only things that are not man-made. They're not made of concrete and they're living beings that just stand there on the streets surrounded by buildings that are often smaller than they are. The trees can dwarf the buildings, especially in the East Village, where the streets are much narrower. So it was like a slow realization. I don't even know if at the time if I was aware of all of this. It was just years later. I So at the time, so that was back in 2004, 2005, I started making these tree drawings. Very simple. Um, the way you would use to identify trees, you use the silhouette, the winter silhouette, where you can see the branches, the structure of the tree, to ID them. And so I, I made these as a way to, just to learn who the trees were, these people, the tree people that I was passing 
on my walks. I, I'm a big walker, or I used to be before COVID. And so these drawings were very simple little black and white ink portraits. And it, it took years. You know, I was making them very small scale. And then I slowly started making them larger and larger when I realized, hey, I have my own apartment with the desk and I could get bigger pieces of paper. And I didn't really understand what I was going to do with them or what was the point of them because they look so different from the you know the real artwork that I was seeing in galleries and museums and in New York City and then it was 10 years later like exactly 10 years later in the winter of 2015 when I realized <laughs> oh the trees the tree drawings are the characters they, like I literally it was this flash you know when you're half awake half asleep this meditative state that's when all my ideas. That's when I'm really most productive and get all my work done. And that's, it just came in this instant where I saw that the tree drawings that I had like started making 10 years before were literally sprouting on a blank piece of paper. And I realized that the, it was like the seed was there, like a full stop that you would see or a comma looks just like how a seed germinates. And then when you type on a blank screen on a keyboard, the letter appears. And I saw the trees appearing and I thought, oh yeah, it's that simple. The tree drawings replace the letters. And so then it's a way to immediately break down our human centric, because this was, you know, 2015, I had started a series of Sunday salons where we were having conversations about the possibilities for art and activism in the Anthropocene. How can we do something as artists and writers to really help with this climate emergency and this situation that we're in? You know, so I was really in a place of deep existential despair and anger and upset and fury, like all these emotions that you go through with climate grief and everything and frustration, very frustrated. It was also the build up to the 2016 election was happening too. So there was all this politics. Remember how language was being twisted into pretzels with truth was being broken. There was all of that nasty, horrible stuff was going on. So it just felt like a very simple way to cut through all of that. And here's a way to go outside of our human-centered language and replace our letters, like replace the ABC, start fresh, replace all of the ABCs with trees. And then maybe that can help us see something clearly. But if it doesn't, at least it looks pretty. And it's a way to engage, you know, because it's supposed to, a lot of my work is, you know, it might be very dark, like come from these dark political questions that I inevitably you you get to if you're interested in humans and being on planet earth right it's very dark but the hope is that there's always some joy or humor you got to have, have this lightheartedness and i think with the the alphabet the tree alphabet immediately makes you well makes me think of being a child learning your abc's and that whole playfulness and my sister had had identical twin daughters around then I'm trying to think now of the timing. Was this right before they were born? <laughs> but I think it was all connected. So this learning your ABCs, the, the freshness and the excitement of starting from scratch. Because I think education is a huge part of these issues that we're grappling with. And so so going right back to the alphabet is is very important. I think we need to remember that the, the alphabet itself, you know, it came from pictograph images. So like the letter A was representing an oxen and the the ram's head with the horns. And so letters did mean something. And obviously being Irish, we have the whole history of the Oum, that medieval tree alphabet where the letters were trees. So seeing language is very much something that's alive and evolves with culture. Very important, I think. I love that, the whole concept of it. And it's nice that the book is kind of structured around it. And when I was listening to you talk then, I, I did think to myself, that was your input into the book. And the whole book, though, is a kind of product of everybody who contributed and allowed you to use their work. But you ultimately kind of pulled it together. But was there anything that stood out to you? I know this is a really difficult question. I'm putting you on the spot and you may not be able to answer it really. But was there any particular piece that you included that really resonated with you above anything else? <laughs> well, yeah, a few people have been asking me this. Uh, it's another way of asking if I have a favourite. <laughs> yes, I know. And that's uh, a tough question, I know. Uh, yeah, What's your favourite today? Yeah. It can be different tomorrow. <laughs> well, I gave that silly answer where 
people say, oh, but I can't have a favorite child. That's like, you know, I need to pick a favorite child. Like there are things that I just felt were keystones, very fundamental, like really important. I really felt Robin Wall Kimmerer, for example. Like I know so many people have read Braiding Sweetgrass. That's her book has kind of swept the world. So that work is already out there, but it felt really important to try and include the grammar of animacy. So she talks about fixing the pronoun problem, where in our English language, animals and non-humans are all it's, you know, that little word it, I-T, and replacing it with something like he, which is comes is related to kin. And just her her work and her, everything that Robin has been doing for so long. So I, sp- I did spend a lot of time in my editor's helpful took a lot of time to help me try and track down Robin because she's so in demand <laughs> so that felt really important to include Robin but I, you know it's not like I can say oh that's my favorite piece I was honored and I'm still completely <laughs> gobsmacked that Ross Gay offered to write the introduction I still haven't met Ross hopefully one day we'll get to meet I love his work it's just so important and and beautiful and full of joy. So to have the gift of being offered, someone says they would want to respond to your work. So he so he wrote the, the introduction especially. Oh, oh, and Ada Lamone, I feel like that was a gift as well because I had reached out. Um, I had no idea at the time that she was about to be announced as the new Poet Laureate for um, the United States. So I think I was like the last person to get <laughs> Ada to do something she shared a poem for the lang- in the language of trees and then the announcement came that she's the new Port Laureate, which means she's completely swept up for the next couple of years. Oh, yeah, too many. Oh, maybe I should mention Radiohead. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to let them know about the book because that was one of the few ones that, sadly, I couldn't do it through a personal connection. It had to be official through the, the agency that's in charge of the copyright so that's all very formal um and obviously because now i'm touring ireland and the uk and you know, i'm going to be at festivals and i saw colin greenwood's going to be at one of the festivals that i can't be at next weekend so if you're listening hey colin and tom and all the others yeah there's this book called the language of trees and then it includes fake plastic trees and i'd love for them to get a copy and to hopefully enjoy it and see how but this is what I hope is that, you know, people who are part of it, part of the community, whether that's with their own work inside of the book or a reader who picks it up, that you feel kind of connected to something bigger, right, than yourself. Because I think that's what we we all want as humans. Like, it's not just me trying to cope with this really hard reality of we've just all gone through this COVID, we're still going through it. And it can feel very lonely and difficult. It's really hard. I think, you know, we're all still coping in whatever way we use. And I think trees and and this beautiful planet has so much to offer to help us all together, figure out how to work together. And hopefully the book is a small way of, of helping with that. Thank you very much to Katie for talking about her brilliant work. And thanks to you, as always, for listening. I just wanted to say a thank you too to the recent Patreon and GoFundMe supporters. I do very much appreciate your contributions, which help me keep the Roots and All website going, pay for podcast hosting, and for the fabulous Pete who edits the episodes. I'm not interested in accepting ads on the podcast, even though it could make some money. Because honestly, who wants their listening interrupted by ads for stuff that's totally unrelated to the content you came here for? I was pondering the whole idea of ads though, and in my typical contrarian fashion, I thought it would be much nicer to just shout out people I know who run businesses and are good people or who offer a good service that I've personally experienced. So you can choose to support these businesses and or support me on Patreon or GoFundMe to allow me to remain independent and able to give shout outs to nice people or not. But if not, and I've said it a million times before, if you appreciate small independent media, you have to put your money where your mouth is in order for it to continue. And that goes for any free content that you are digesting. So my first recommendation for good people with a good business is Hannah and Tom who run Starcroft Farm Cabins in my hometown of Catsfield. They've just opened their cabins to guests and are taking bookings right now. I've watched their journey as they've built these beautiful cabins using local craftspeople. Every detail is exquisite and thoughtful and it looks like the perfect retreat if you want some rest and relaxation. 
I've put a link to their website in the show notes and their Starcroft Farm cabins on Instagram. So give them a follow and make sure to check out their amazing stained glass. Thank you. I'll leave you now with Dr Ian Bedford and a bug you don't want to meet in a dark alley. Around 20 years ago, European countries were on alert for the arrival of a notorious foreign predator that had recently been spotted within France. This predator was a large species of social wasp that originated from the Far East, called Vespa velatina, more commonly known as the Asian hornet. And what made this hornet such a concern for Europe was the fact it voraciously predated on honeybees, strategically massacring whole colonies by ambushing and decapitating the honeybees as they returned to their hives, then taking the headless bodies back to their nests where they were fed to their young. But despite their aggression towards bees, Asian hornets were actually no more risk to humans than Europe's native wasps. But it was the threat they posed to the 19 million beehives of Europe's honey industry that caused most concern. Over the following years, though, it proved impossible to contain the Asian hornet as it spread through France and into the bordering countries. And currently, it's predicted to spread further within mainland Europe and into the surrounding islands, which unfortunately includes Britain. So to help protect Britain's apiculture from Asian hornets, we should first learn to recognise it and to tell it apart from our native hornet, which is not a threat to bees. And this is quite simple to do, since Asian hornets are slightly smaller than the native hornet and they have yellow legs. They're also quite dark in colour, with just one wide yellow band around the end of their abdomens. Whereas the native hornet is primarily yellow, with thin black bands or spots down its body. And we'll need to keep watching out for Asian hornets throughout each year, which includes autumn, when a queen might be feeding on the nectar of late flowering plants such as ivy, before she hibernates through winter. But no matter what time of year it is, if you think you've spotted an Asian hornet, then take note of its location and also the direction it flies off in, since during summer this could help in locating a nest. Then either report your sightings on the gov.uk website or seek advice through the local beekeepers association. But despite the establishment of Asian hornets within mainland Europe, confirmed sightings have remained low in Britain, with less than 30 since 2016. However, three of these were during April 2023. So for the sake of Britain's apiculture, it's honeybees and possibly native bee species too. It really would be helpful if we all learnt to recognise Asian hornets and kept an eye open for them. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.